Hello, everybody. I think I'm live. I believe everything is all in order. And if so, hopefully you're connected right now or watching on the replay in the distant future. Either way, thank you so much for joining me. There wasn't any music at the beginning, as there has been in previous episodes. And the quick reason why is for me to play music at the beginning means that I already have to start my live stream, which is fine. But it means that anyone watching on the replay had to fast forward um, the start of the video to get through all that waiting screen and, and the music they had to go through like five or six or seven minutes worth of fast forwarding and I felt like that wasn't very cool for people on the replay so that's why it looked the same today uh, but it didn't sound the same there won't be any music at the start but that's all right I'll find ways to slip music in here and there hi everybody welcome 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 let's see there are yeah about 75 of you live I want to welcome you I hope you're doing all right I'm going to stall just a moment until the rest of you connect. I hope wherever you are in the world, you are feeling okay, uh, both in here and up here. As I've been saying lately, I'm coming to you from the jungle, as you can see. This is not the home edition, this is the jungle edition. And I can see all your bonjours and hellos coming in from all over. Really appreciate it. If, I, if I'm ever looking down, that just means I'm checking out the comments. Um, it's great to, great to see you all and have you here. So yeah, coming to you from the, this is sort of a jungle edition. And the backyard is sprouting nicely. This is the first spring that Charlotte and I, my wife, have really seen the fruits of our labor. These are all plants and flowers we planted last year. And it's great and perhaps very fitting. I try to put myself in the most colorful and lush spot um, in honor of today's episode. So you probably already know via the title, this is going to be, uh, this is a very special one because two years ago this weekend, there's a reason that I held off on this episode until specifically this Saturday. It's because exactly two years ago, uh, one of the most extraordinary experiences happened to me, really something that's going to go down as this magical once in a lifetime moment that I'll always cherish. And it was private access after hours into the gardens at Givani, Monet's famous Impressionist Gardens. And it all happened thanks to a lovely woman by the name of Suen Hum. Sue Ann is many things. Uh, she is a, a great follower and supporter and fan of my work here, but also she's a very talented and successful painter. And also she um, organizes small group cultural excursions throughout Europe, art excursions and whatnot. And she brings people to, to me and I give them tours through parts of Paris. So she, two years ago, uh, gave me an offer that I couldn't refuse. She said, Corey, I'm getting, I've procured a private access into Monet's gardens after the doors close to the public. What do you think about coming over and you can do one of your live stream tours from the gardens? And of course it was like a cartoon where it was just a puff of smoke and I was out of there like I was on my way. And so this is the, the series of photos that I took as I was preparing the live stream and as I was just, just really a, in seventh heaven walking through these gardens. I thought we would revisit it exactly two years later. So that's about it. Welcome everybody if you're just joining. Uh, usually the series is episode 82. Usually it's a series I say that I am on the streets of Paris and I help you pretend that you're there, but now of course we're, I'm in my backyard pretending to be on the streets to help you pretend that you're there. And God forbid I ever get kicked out of my house, I'll have to pretend that I'm in the backyard pretending to be on the streets, pretending you, you get the idea. So everyone's feeling good. Danielle Molden says that was a gorgeous episode. I will, uh, that's on Facebook. I posted the link to my live stream two years ago. Uh, my Facebook live stream here in the description so if you want to watch that and maybe I'll upstream, uh, upstream a version or upload a version to, to YouTube as well. So why don't we just jump right into it. Let me bring up, I'm going to show you Sue Ann Hum who is the lady responsible for all of this loveliness. This is a photo of the two of us at Giveni and you can see we're not enjoying ourselves at all. So Sue Ann Hum um, sells her work online and she does commissions and you, you can find the link to our website. Uh, in the description here if you want to check out her her work and what she's up to and you can also learn more about her artistic excursions her small groups that she leads through Europe and that link is in the description so I encourage, encourage you to go check out Sue Ann Hum and give her some love uh, on the internet. So the tra there were train strikes that day when I had to go out to Giveni and I wasn't going to be able to get as close as I wanted. And she said, no problem, I've got a car here. And she was so generous, Sue Ann hopped in her car, drove a good 45 minutes each way to pick me up at a different station and to drive me uh, to Giverny. And in fact, she didn't drive me to Giverny exactly. So let's jump into the story. Our first stop was this beautiful little bed and breakfast just down the road from Monet's house. And it's the, it's the place where Sue Ann Hum and her husband stay when they're in the little village of Giverny. And 
it's set in this extraordinary property, which I'm going to show you photos of in just a second, but the name of it is Le Moulin des Chenevières. And of course, I put the description, uh, the link rather, in the description. So you can check this out. They've got just a few rooms, three or four rooms, I think, to rent as a bed and breakfast. Um, but if, you're, if you want to, you know, do Giverny in style and spend the night like Sue Ann Hum does, um, then you definitely want to check this out. So let's move ahead and I'll show you some of the, some of the property here. Thank you to Heather Jackson, who just sent a super chat, as did, let me see that, Leslie T, who says, happy Saturday. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And Peggy Baker already sending the, the super chat. So you, that dollar sign next to where you're commenting, if you wish, you can send me a little tip for this video, a little bit of a donation. I always appreciate that. So I remember when I was in this space, hadn't even gotten to Monet's house yet. Sue Ann was excited, of course, to share this with me, and she was, t I remember, Sue Ann, if you're out there uh, in the audience, she was telling me about her, the history of this place and her time, her experience here at this bed and breakfast and what it is and whatnot, and I almost couldn't even hear her because I was just so mesmerized by this space and, of course, snapping photos all along the way. David Dubois here says he's watching me through the TV. Great, David. That reminds me, everybody who's watching this on YouTube, uh, you may want to, if your connection's good, switch the, the video settings right now to 1080p, the max quality. So this is the front of the bed and breakfast, and my goodness, that awning is just so perfect, isn't it? I think it's cute how they got the little uh, American flag out there, too, because they certainly do have American visitors. The town of Giverny in Monet's day in the 19th century w had only a population of about 300 people. Remarkably, though, today, nowadays, there are only about 500 full-time residents in Giverny, so it still uh, maintains a very quaint atmosphere, despite, as you would assume, all of the tourists that flood in in the spring, summer, and fall. But yeah, that, that atmosphere of being the quaint Giverny of Monet's day isn't completely gone, which of course is so fun. And I want to zoom in some more on, the, on some details of this facade. Look at this, how fantastic is this? Because I believe this is the main doorway. If you look towards the lower left of this image, there's an old tiny chainsaw, which I wonder if it still works. That would be uh, just fantastic. And then of course that beautiful, perfect old rocking chair. And look at that razor scooter. Cast iron, that sucker. It's been around. You know, things were built to last back then. And isn't it adorable with its little metal handlebars? I absolutely love it. You've also got on the right-hand side, uh, like a bugle and the windowsill and an old pulley. And that red machine in the corner, I don't know if that would have been a pump of some sort or for air or maybe even a gas pump. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. So if you're just joining, this is the bed and breakfast that Sue Ann Hum took me to. This is where she stays. That window up top uh, towards the left there, that's sort of the master bedroom that you can rent, and that's where Sue and her husband stay. Look at those old-timey motorcycles. They've got to be from, like, World War II era. Actually, absolutely stunning. Thanks, Ro Fielden, who's joining live for the first time. Uh, and send a super chat. Really appreciate that. Fred Smizer with a donation. David Dubois, Lin Sakai, you're all so wonderful. Really appreciate that. Send in the love, and I'm sending it right back to you. Now, if you come around to the back, there is a, a mill of sorts, a water mill. And this was, this is called Le Moulin. Uh, so this place had a mill or still has a mill, but clearly this was the little creek, the little stream that would have powered it in the back. And this next image is the, the little river itself. And I just, this is one image that I particularly love here coming up, which is uh, just a stunner. Look at that. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So this was all even before I got my private access to Giverny. And so we still had some time to kill because the gardens hadn't been closed yet. So uh, we met up with Sue's husband, husband, had a lovely meal together and chatted. Um, I have an art, arts background. It's what I studied in college. It was my major. So uh, Sue, and, Sue Ann and I always have, you know, exciting stuff to talk about. And then uh, eventually it was closing time at, at Giverny, uh, the Monet Gardens. And so that was, it was go time for us. And uh, so we essentially went from this view to this next view, which is, oh my, good, just, my goodness, just take your breath away. At least it takes mine away. Wow, wow, wow. You can see Daniel Molden commenting with a lot of hearts and saying no words. Wow. So for those who have been to Giverny, you know just how magical this place can be, particularly if you've got any sort of interest in Monet or Impressionism or the arts and 
especially if you've been an artist or are an artist yourself. This was this is an absolute mecca, and it's really I felt like I was on hollow, hollowed ground. This was not my first time in Givani when I was here two years ago, but it was certainly the the first time and the only time I think that I'll ever have it all to myself. So you will not see any human beings in these photos because this is as I was prepping my live stream tour that I did and just snapping photos and just beside myself, beside myself. Before we take a stroll through these gardens, a nice slow walk through Monet's uh, property, he moved here in 1883, which was a time where he was in his early 40s, which is interesting because it was the same age of myself right now. And I always think that's, that's interesting, not, not necessarily because I compare myself to these people you know, at the same stage, because I think that's a fast route to depression, quite honestly, uh, to compare yourselves and, and your own accomplishments to, to these geniuses. But what I do like is just think about like what, what his mindset might have been like. And he had a couple of kids, as I do, and et cetera, et cetera. And so it, interesting to know that he was 42, 43 years old when he was first moving into this place. He had discovered this house that you see that we're going to explore later. He had discovered it through one of his country walks through Givani as he was getting to know the village. And it was, um, it was a rather rundown former pressoir, which meant that they were pressing grapes originally. And it had been converted back then into a sort of this rustic old country home. And Monet just fell in love with the house and the property in general. And he decided he needed to live there. So 1883, he starts renting this property. He did not buy it outright. He couldn't afford to. And eventually his paintings would sell enough that he could afford to buy it several years later. So we're going to start our walk through the gardens here. And I hope you enjoy it. My goodness, just speechless. Thank you, Elaine Living Good, for your donation that you just sent. Appreciate that. Bonnie Turbeville. Ah, you're all so generous. I really it makes a big difference. Mary Kia also uh, says hollowed ground for sure. So as you may know already, Monet built these, he constructed these gardens. They were a conception of his, because he wanted to, to, to be around flowers, to study flowers, to paint them above all. And he, of course, would paint all kinds of series of, of, of paintings from here. We know that. Uh, it started with just his own manual labor. He was out there himself raking and digging and planting and a lot of elbow grease. He became a rather expert gardener as a result. And he once said, quote, Outside of painting and gardening, I'm good for nothing. Which I guess if you've got to pick two goods, uh, two things to be good at, rather, those are, you know, good ones to choose. He later would hire a garden staff of five professionals, but he still always closely monitored their work and made sure that he made the key decisions about which flowers would be where. He was very serious about it. He had so much respect for his garden that he wouldn't allow his children talk to the flowers and call them tu, which is the informal way of saying you, like, ah, tu es joli, tu es belle. When the kids talk to the flowers, they had to use the more formal version of vous. And that's just how much respect he had for the, for the, for the flowers that he had planted in the gardens that he had created here. It was really a labor of love. There were special meetings through all of these gardens of people, dignitaries and notables that would stroll through here. We're talking, of course, uh, Renoir would spend time here, and Cezanne, and Rodin, and the Impressionist painter Cicely. There was even a special meeting where Monet literally introduced the sculptor Rodin to Cezanne here at Givani, and that must have been a spectacular place, a uh, spectacular event. French, uh, French President Clemenceau uh, was very close to Monet and would spend time here as well. They were very, very good friends. And... Uh, they say that Monet died in Clemenceau's arms, in fact, here at Giverny. They both had a, a love for flowers, and of course, Clem President Clemenceau uh, really, really revered Monet, as, called him the, the greatest living French artist. You know, Monet, though, there was a dichotomy of, on one side, he was a character who was a very content, meditative gar gardener and a father figure of the house, and of course, painting all the time. But then he also had this side where he was a very moody, artist susceptible, susceptible to fits of rage and irritability and lots of self-doubt, lots and lots of self-doubt. He once said um, the following quote, he said, painting is almost always torture, which is hard to, to consider when we see the, the, the beauty that he surrounded himself with and we know the, the, 
the beauty of the products of the paintings that were produced. He also once said, color is my day-long obsession, but it's also my joy and my torment. And I think, of course, the torment came in at the point where he was trying to capture them on canvas. Thank you, Keith, for the very, oh my goodness, Keith, Keith uh, Hitke, Hitke, is that how you pronounce it? Wow, big shout out to Keith, he gave me a very generous super chat. Kate Addis is there, I see you. Yesenia Lopez, the lovely Yesenia and her husband. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that his husband, um, can I remember it? The husband's name is Jerry, is that it? I hope so, Yesenia. You tell me, give me a thumbs up or a big thumbs down if your husband's name's not Jerry, but he's lovely. Daniel Molden, very generous. Thank you, everybody. So let's move in closer to the house. When I live streamed this, and again, the link is in the description of the actual live tour that I gave, the broadcast, I wasn't able to get in the house uh, because it was, uh, there was, there wasn't enough signal. I needed cell service to show you live, but luckily now, uh, this time around, I can share some photos of the interiors and a few of the rooms that I find to be noteworthy and interesting historically. But before we even get there, look at these tulips. My goodness, we're going to talk about those in a moment, but Monet was a big fan of tulips. I want to talk about the, the very unconventional, uh, unconventional, rather, family arrangement, the living arrangement here in Monet's house at Giverny. Monet himself had two children from a previous wife, uh, his wife Camille, who sadly passed away before he moved here to Giverny. So it was Monet and his two children. Uh, but he was in love with a lady named Alice Oshede. Alice Oshede. And it was a woman he loved dearly, and she had six children of her own. Not only did she have the six kids, but Alice was married at the time. So there was a little bit of a 19th century impressionistic menage a trois happening here. Um, you had Monet, the woman that he loved, Alice, all of their kids, their eight children, and then Alice's husband, who was a big fan of Monet. Uh, they, they were friendly to some extent, apparently they were admirers of each other. So that must have been an interesting dynamic here. And for that reason, the people of Giverny were actually a little bit, yeah, they didn't always get along with the, with the Monet family and vice versa because I, people couldn't quite figure out what was going on here at this house. But yeah, unconventional to say the least. And of those eight kids that were running in and out and through the gardens all, all day, two of them would actually end up getting married and we'll talk about that later on. And um, one of Monet's kids and one of Alice's kids. And then eventually when Alice's husband passed away, Monet and Alice got married. They made it official. So very interesting, the, the backstory. Let's move on to the tulips now. Monet loved tulips especially. And I was lucky enough that they were all in bloom here when I visited two years ago. He would go on special voyages throughout Europe specifically just to paint tulips. And in his own garden, he employed uh, all the colors available, everything from the, the bright reds to the blacks. And when I was here, before I walked into the house, I brought one postcard with me, one image that I wanted to compare to the actual scene. And this is a photo of me doing that. It's beautiful. I believe it's a Kodachrome image. And it shows the man himself. When he moved there, his beard wasn't gray, but it got, it got there eventually, as is mine, to be honest. And uh, so I sussed out sort of where this photo would have been taken, and my goodness. If you follow me before, you know I'm a fan of holding up images like this and imagining myself way back in time. And as I said, just for a, a guy who majored in fine arts, painting, art history, this was, and still is, just for me to look back at these photos, it's just an absolute joy. And, you know, Sue Ann Hum, the lady responsible for this, is really, she gets so much credit for giving me a once-in-a-lifetime experience. While we're paused here, let me thank a couple of other donations. My, Ellen Fry, my dear mother, who I love dearly. Hello, Ellen. She says, Giovanni was just magic for me. Thanks for this. I really appreciate that. So let's make our way into the house. I, I won't show you photos of all the house, but as I said, a few notable rooms that I found. This one right here uh, was originally the barn at the end of the house and it was converted by Monet into what would become his first studio. So at first, this is where he would paint when he was getting started. He would eventually move into a much bigger studio where he would paint his fam famous Water Lily series, etc. And then eventually this became a drawing room. And uh, on the walls he put his own paintings from different periods of his life because he wanted memories of his life, sort of a timeline that would play out in front of his eyes, and it was comforting to him. And then he would also invite his guests when he had them in his house um, to come here and have a, a drink and a smoke and to 
look at Monet's paintings and talk about them, and it became essentially a gallery. These used to be originals, of course, and then all the originals were removed and sent to the great museums of the world, like the Orsay and the Marmottan Monet in Paris. Um, but these were all done. These are um, very close facsimiles that were painted by a, a high-end gallery in Paris. And they arranged these paintings in the same exact way, apparently, that Monet had originally organized them leading up to his death. So it's a very faithful reconstruction of how he wanted his images uh, displayed. Thank you, Linda Luft, for that generous Super Chat donation. I appreciate it. Just beautiful. Natalie Hayes says, oh my goodness, I didn't get to go inside when I was there. This is gorgeous. Lisa Cruz says, oh, to sit amongst those paintings. I know, I can't believe it. Now, if we move upstairs, this is Monet's bedroom, speaking of paintings. And I hope, hope these images aren't going too fast for you. I um, have been slowing down my, my images uh, more and more each episode because I don't want to rush things. I hate feeling rushed during these episodes, and I certainly don't want you to. So I, I keep, you know, prolonging the time that we spend with each image. And I hope that, I hope you don't mind. I hope you appreciate it. So this is Monet's bedroom. This is, in fact, the bedroom where he would one day pass away in 1926. And what he hung on the walls here were not his own paintings. He hung walls, uh, sorry, hung um, paintings of his friends. And of course, those are a lot of the Impressionists. So we're, we're talking about Cezanne and Renoir and the great female painter Berthe Morisot. So that's what you see here, of course, reproductions of the originals. And he also had a couple of Delacroix paintings hanging in his, in his bedroom. Delacroix was a big influence on the Impressionists. They looked up to him as a hero. And um, a lot of Delacroix's style was, in a way, a precursor to Impressionism. Now, what he also had here, has anyone noticed what's above the bed? Yes, exactly. I see Heather Jackson says, just says, uh, said the, the painting above the bed. So if you didn't uh, notice it already, that beauty right there, that is our beloved painting by Mr. Caibot called Paris Street Rainy Day. And Monet literally had it hanging above his head. Now, this turns out this wasn't the, the final painting of Caibot. It's not the actual famous one, but this was a preparatory study, um, sort of a rough draft that Caibot had done, which was all too common for artists to lay out their composition and their colors and give the basic um, feeling of what their final painting would be. So Monet had this freaking thing hanging above his head every night when he went to sleep. Can you imagine? Now, if, you, if you're not familiar with my previous episodes and you want to learn more about that famous painting by Caibot, uh, you should check out my previous episode number 73. It was entitled, Where They Painted at Gare Saint-Lazare. And I went to the exact spot where that picture was painted, where Caibot set up his easel. And um, I did that for many paintings in that episode. So I will put a link. I think I haven't yet, but in the description, I'll put a link uh, to that episode number 73. That was an absolute beauty. So just in this room alone, if you had this collection that Monet had hanging on his bedroom walls today, you would be rich beyond your wildest dreams just with this one little collection. I just, I, just can't be, I just can't believe it. I mean, you can't see me right now, but I'm just kind of like shrugging my shoulders and shaking my head with a big smile on my face. Uh, by the way, to top it all off, he had a hell of a view uh, through his window. So if you turn back through the window here or to the right-hand side, you're gonna see he was able to enjoy his masterpiece, as it were. And we'll see more of the garden later in the lily ponds and all of that. Now, if you make your way back through, we're gonna turn back through, and of course, this is Monet's room once more. We're going to make our way into a, another bedroom, which is called Blanche's bedroom, La Chambre de Blanche. So who was Blanche? Blanche was one of those children, one of the six children that Alice brought along with her. And as I mentioned earlier, the two, two of the children married each other. It was Monet's son who married his housemate, as it were, Alice's daughter, Blanche. And they had their own life. And then later when uh, Monet's son passed away, Blanche was a widow, and she moved back into Giverny to take care of an, an older Monet who needed help, um, who needed assistance. And so this was Blanche's bedroom, and that's why it's called that still today. Blanche was a painter herself, and so obviously her and, she and Monet had uh, that connection. And she would even accompany Monet on some of his painting excursions and the trips that he would go on. So she was sort of, Blanche was sort of an, an informal pupil of Monet's, and surely she must have benefited as an artist from that. And Monet always talked of her as being not just a, a daughter-in-law, but truly one of his own, own children. He was exceptionally close with her. So it's nice that her 
bedroom is preserved here. And then, you know, just a Cezanne hanging on the door, no big deal. Lucien loves the wallpaper. So here we get to the iconic bright yellow dining room. This is one of those rooms that you just, once, once you're there, you'll never forget it, right? Am I right? Like some of those, I'm sure if you've already been through Giverny, you definitely remember this room. It leaves an impression, so to speak. No pun intended, leaves an impression. Uh, the color of the walls and the furniture here were chosen by Monet. And if, if you're wondering, if you're curious, the, the actual color of this yellow, it's called chrome yellow. Occasionally, it's called light chrome yellow. So if any of you want to recreate this in your own home, uh, that's the color that you want to shoot for. Or I suppose if you want to paint an image of this, a canvas, then you could choose chrome yellow to recreate the, the impression here. And um, delighted visitors, if they were lucky enough to be invited by Monet to, to dine in the house, they were always blown away by this, the beauty of this room. It was so charming and it felt, of course, like being inside of a painting. Although I guess you could argue it kind of feels like being inside of a banana as well, maybe fitting for a dining room. But just charming with the original flooring, you know, a flooring that wasn't too flashy, but very utilitarian and did the job. And these two, I don't know if they're credenzas, but they're two cabinets. They still hold two original sets of china or two original services, I should say, that Monet's family would have used um, some hundred years ago. So one of them was the everyday service and then one of them was the fancy stuff that they'd bring out for their guests. And the walls were adorned, thanks to Monet, with a lot of Japanese prints and those sorts of motifs, which he was a big fan of. Danielle says, it's strange painting everything one color in a room. Oh yeah, it's definitely unique. So this is where Monet would eat his favorite dishes, including duck and partridge and asparagus and green salads. He loved all that stuff. He, you'd have to come here exactly at 12.30 p.m., for lunch. He had he ran a tight ship Monet and he was very irritable if people didn't follow his schedule. So he had to be in this room exactly at 1230 to eat and if he didn't he would get um, quite annoyed. But again just imagine enjoying that view whenever you need to. Wow that would help you digest your meal. I don't have a lot of images of the kitchen but this is the kitchen right next door and these blue and white ceramic tiles come from Rouen which is not too far from Giverny, about halfway between Giverny and the English Channel up in Normandy. And I always love a good copper pot shot. And then moving outside the house, uh, this right here, the entrance that you see there, today is the gift shop, the gift shop of, of Giverny, but it was uh, his last studio. Huge studio, almost like, a, like an airport hangar, like an airline hangar. And... Um, he painted his water lilies in there famously. He needed a lot of space, of course. And so gift shop today, but was his third and last studio where he did a lot of his late work. If we turn ourselves back around away from the house toward the garden, uh, I wanted to share with you this beautiful image of a, of a bench. Look at this. Can you imagine spending a little bit of time just right there? Although maybe you could argue the bench has turned the wrong way. It's turned toward the house. And moving on through the garden, because we need to make our way from all this loveliness to more loveliness known as the water garden. <laughs> Margaret says, if they let me stay there, I'll polish the pots. Might be a little waiting list there. So the little sign tells us that this way to the, the pond of the lilies. We'll make our way there nice and slow. Michael and Kelly say, charcuterie spaces everywhere. Loving this episode, Corey. I appreciate it. I'm glad, glad that you're here. Pam says, he skipped the kitchen. Well, I, I only had so many photos, Pam, that were good enough to share with this. Um, so at the time, I didn't know. I was running through really quick, and I didn't know that I, two years later, would be constructing a photo essay of this space. So sadly, yeah, I don't have too many photos of the kitchen. There's always next time. 
Thank you, Diana, for the super chat. She says, merci beaucoup. So for those of you who have visited Giverny, you know that to get to the water garden, you have to pass under a street. That street existed in Monet's time, and he had to deal with it. Um, used to cross over it, now we go under it. It's called, the, the street itself is called the Chemin du Roi. It's named after Saint Louis, the medieval French king, Saint Louis. He used that street, or that road, that dirt road, to pass from Paris through into Normandy to see his mother. And so it was called the Path of the King, the Chemin du Roi, and it still is today. Then eventually they would lay train tracks on the road and there would be a railway cutting through. So keep that in mind. You pass under the tunnel and now you're in the, the Jardin d'eau, the water garden. And the first thing that you see when you come into the water garden are a series of these sort of bamboo forests. And of course it ties into the Japanese theme that uh, Monet was such a, a fan of. But also it, it added sort of a, first of all, it was very calming. It filled a lot of space, which I think Monet enjoyed. Um, and then also it, it creates a vertical, right, visually. If you're into that, 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 those vertical lines really help to break up the monotony is not the right word, but the repetitive aspect of the flower beds. And I also think I'd be willing to bet that Monet saw the visuals of this bamboo as almost a palette cleanser, moving from the main gardens where the house is, and before you get to the lily ponds and all of that, uh, this almost does cleanse the, the palette as far as the, a visual goes. And so I think the bamboo is very effective in that way. And then you meander your way through and then you get to the, the body of water itself. Believe it or not, Monet didn't start work on this section until 1893. In other words, 10 years after he first moved into Giverny. So he rented for many, many years, then purchased the place, and then it was still a few years before he managed to create this because he had to divert a little river and he had to create this whole space. And it was just a, a combination of a decade of planning. So he certainly deserved it. And of course, that Japanese bridge is, um, is a highlight for a lot of people, a couple of them and very photogenic. And of course, Monet would paint it often and then also he would um, pose on the bridge as well when he had photographs taken of himself and friends. This is on the bridge looking through it. Thank you, Vivian, so much for that generous super chat. She said, Saturday morning with Corey is the best gateway uh, while on the lockdown in Los Angeles. I really appreciate that. I'm glad that I can help in some small way to help transport you all and maybe distract you for a few minutes. Now this was springtime two years ago, so the lily pads were not quite there yet. The, the few that you can see here um, throughout my photos were the leftovers from the previous summer, but that was all right. Still created a nice effect. And I truly did get emotional when I came through here. Truly did get emotional. Just a once in a lifetime to, to be here with no people and to just, just alone with Monet. Now I crossed back over here, we're almost um, getting to the end and the sun was starting to set, it was getting low in the sky and it just created these beautiful um, shadows and this contrast of light. Thank you, Kristen Parker. I appreciate that. I see you may, have, you may have missed the amount that you were trying to type in there, Kristen. You may have to give it another go, but I can see where you're... I can see what you tried to donate, and I appreciate that. Look at this light. Stunning. So this is my last photo of that session, and just such a magical experience. I mean, made even more special by the way that sadly this is no longer possible anymore. Um, I've talked to Sue Ann Hum, who was the one who procured the, the private access here. And she used to simply ask for it officially and, and, and have a conversation with them and organize it. But now they stopped doing that. T 2019 was the very last time they allowed this for anybody. So it's no longer possible, even for those who are in the know. Uh, so 
it really, I don't know if I'll ever be able to get in here alone again. And so I'm so glad that I have these photos and these memories. And um, Sue Ann gets a lot of credit for that. Again, um, check out in the description, I have links to Sue Ann's artwork and, and her trips that she brings people to Givani and to Paris and throughout. And so I know not people aren't traveling right now, but you may want to uh, next year, for example, and you can check that out. It's called myarttrip.com. Ah, they're doing some work on the house, so. A little bit of the real world it's being slapped in the face with the real world here, but I'm still in my, in my jungle, in my cute little colorful, my tiny, 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 tiny version of, of Givani. I want to thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this. Keep coming back every Saturday for a little bit of transportation and uh, for another home edition. I'm going to wrap this up now, especially with the noise that has come, come in. And uh, if you're a Patreon member and a supporter, come over into the Facebook group, the Cafe Chats group. I'm going to have a special guest and I'm, we're going to talk about meditation. And so Lisa Cruz is going to join me. And it's just one of the perks, these um, champagne chats, as it were, uh, of the Patreon uh, sort of membership subscription formula. So you can find a link to that if you want to support me now more than ever is a great time to pull the trigger on that thank you everybody for the donations along the way i really appreciate that i can see everyone's laura poffenberger and robin ward and christine surratt and david dubois phyllis you're all thanking me and i thank you from the bottom of my heart i'm not going to drag out this goodbye because i have a feeling it's going to be a noisy one but that was my private vip access it felt like into Givani and uh, monet's gardens really really special give me about 10 minutes folks if you're patrons to uh, get myself prepped here with Lisa and we're gonna have a nice interview and talk about meditation techniques Which we need now more than ever So that's it folks if you can't bring yourself to Paris. I'm gonna bring it to you even if it's from my own backyard uh, Barbara Keeney slipping in a, a donation there at the last minute I see you there Barb and Mark Vickers as well who says thanks for taking me back to Giverny Ricky Beltran as well boy Maybe I should stick around because people seem to be sending the super chats my way Thanks everybody take care and I will talk to some of you in just a few minutes with champagne and cheese and chocolate and the way we like to do it. Take care. Bye-bye.